Okay, I'm going to um, discuss uh, uh, at one level the history of sociology and anthropology in India. And I'm going to discuss it in terms of three uh, phases um, uh, in, from late 19th century onwards uh, uh, till the 1950s from the 50s to the 70s and the 70s onwards. And um, I'm going to discuss this in context with uh, the problem of mythological nationalism. Um, uh, uh, recent uh, interventions, uh, theoretical interventions made by uh, Ulrich Beck, and, and, and other social scientists who, who argue that uh, all across the world, till globalization emerges, um, sociology has been trapped in what they call is methodological nationalism, by which they mean that um, A, the epistemic structure and program of social science was shaped and attached to the experience of being a modern nation state. That is, social sciences got caught in a world divided into societies along the lines of nation states. And secondly, it also implies that thereby it took nationalist discourses, agendas, loyalties, and histories for granted without problem problematizing them. And thirdly, Territorialization of social science imaginary um, uh, happened, and therefore there was a reduction of the analytical space through which social science deciphered social reality. These are the three aspects of uh, methodological nationalism that they discuss, and I want to use that um, to talk about um, what happened in the framing of sociology in India. Now, almost, uh, it's kind of a, um, axiomatic to talk about national sociologists. Uh, and that itself is a problem. Um, that, uh, that has happened since the time professional associations organize themselves in various nation states to organize their own social, own social sciences or own knowledges in a particular way. Um, but this necessarily doesn't happen with sciences. But it only happens with social sciences. And, and that itself is a problem that methodological nationalism addresses. Um, um, so there are international sciences or professional associations which talk about science in the universal while uh, the professional associations of, uh, generally of um, countries talk about uh, what is um, happening in terms of research, teaching, and the practices in, of social sciences within that country. And um, this is an issue which methodological nationalists pick up as to why is there this nationalist orientation to sociology or any political science or economics when there is obviously another position in social science that it, need, it is not nationalist, it's universal. So there is obviously a tension that the methodological nationalism and in the debates of methodological nationalism is picking up. And I would like to address this, but not immediately. Because um, this issue of state, of society, territory, and culture, and the collapse of four into one, that of state, society, territory, and, and culture into one, is something that, um, um, which of course, which methodological nationalists talk about, it's something that um, it, it is the way we have divided structures, 
um, of sociological knowledge. And I just want to start by taking it for granted and then problematize at the end of my presentation. Um, the emphasis on institutions has led to the collapse of state, territory, society, because institutions are organized and structured in terms of nation states. Uh, university, universities, um, uh, etc., are all organized in terms of investments for the production and reproduction of knowledge. Um, in some some states, um, uh, you know, there is uh, just like as it is in the U.S. Uh, um, <coughs> You know, research, um, um, the research funding, etc., organized in terms of its investment, in terms of um, domestic and foreign policy. So, state plays a very major role in the investments that are there. And coming back to India, this was also true for India, because late 19th century, early 20th century, when you could see the growth of uh, sociological knowledge. The first university, first department was established in 1917 at Bombay University. It got established in the context of the colonial state. And the project of the colonial state to create a elite quote unquote native group which can help it to rule the country. So it was a very clear uh, power or um, uh, use of knowledge for the ru colonial rule that there was a linkage between um, the establishment of social sciences, the institution of universities, and um, the growth of, uh, of, of this knowledge. And therefore what I'm going to do is to look at how this knowledge got organized in the colonial period as part of the colonial project the way it interfaced with um, nationalist positions, to what extent the nationalist positions got trapped in the way in which colonial knowledge was organized, or did it stand apart, and then what happened at the time when nation state got formed, an independent nation state got formed. So this is the way in which I would like to um, go ahead uh, and discuss um, and in, in that context, I want to start off by suggesting that um, there is a division of um, uh, social sciences and especially of the study of society into two subjects and two disciplines. One is sociology and one is anthropology. Both study the same, both study this, have the same objective study the same, same arenas, they study societies, but one divides itself, one distinguishes itself from the other by study of the modern versus a study of the traditional. And this, this distinction is a distinction that emerges in the 19th century, um, late 19th century, middle to late 19th century, when um, um, when uh, um, uh, the Orient and the Occident and the West and the East are, uh, are placed against each other. And um, it is in this context that one has to understand that if I'm talking of sociology, I'm also talking of anthropology. So basically when I'm starting discussing the colonial, colonized knowledge and the colonial study of society, and the structuring of sociology also implies the structuring of anthropology. Because it is via the study of anthropology um, that we see the way in which um, um, the first part of the growth of sociology takes place. So if in the late 19th century, sociology found its distinct identity in Europe, the same was true in India as in Africa, as in many parts of the other colonized world, three fourths of the world was colonized by 1950, by 1940s. However, in the case of India, sociology found its representation as anthropology 
British officials and later trained anthropologists initiated the study of India as a pre-modern civilizational society. Their initial task was to end not as modern society. Mind you, capitalism had already uh, entered and reorganized the terrain of, um, of pre-modern life. There's enough historical evidence to suggest that there were incipient developments towards capitalism in, in, in India at that point of time, and that incipient development and um, had been reconstituted in the context of globalizing, uh, in the context of colonialism, and despite that, despite that, what was uh, what was understood, organized, and uh, mapped out and charted out was a study of India as a pre-modern civilizational society. Their initial task was to categorize and classify the groups and communities so that rule can be facilitated. Simultaneously, there was an effort to document social behavior, customs, mores of such individual communities and also to make a region-wise analysis of these communities, thereby creating spatial cultural zones. Two assumptions came to be implicated immediately. The first relating to the distinction and disjunction of these groups living in India from spatial cultural zones of the West and simultaneously creating within India spatial cultural zones. Thus, there was no classes in India, there were only castes or non-modern uh, groups. And secondly, these groups were related to regions and these regions were related to culture. And this collapse that took place was also a part of another assumption, that of boundedness of these groups, now called castes and tribes into um, by a cultural tribute, attribute of spirituality emanating from Hindu civilization. So not only were these groups not, non, uh, not uh, uh, related to any modern categories, but they were all given um, um, uh, a, a sign of being a Hindu as part of being a Hindu civilization or not a Hindu civilization. Religion then got located with region and culture. So there was a collapse at another level of religion. So religion, culture, space, and society all came together in the definition of what constituted the territory of India. India and Hinduism now collapsed into each other. British civil servants and anthropologists and later Indian anthropologists placed the debate of identifying and designating these so-called castes or tribes within the discussion now with of stocks of races. In relation to other stocks of races um, in the Western world, in order to formulate these categories, they took the help of the evolutionary theory, but also Victorian <coughs> social thought associated with race science. In this, they were aided through a theory of Aryan, quote, unquote, white or fair-skinned invasion of India, which grew out of a discovery of the Europeans of the Indo-European language family or in the late 19th century. Hence, linguistic classification merged with racial classification to produce a theory of Indian civilization formed by the invasion of fair screen civilized Sanskrit-speaking Aryans who conquered and partially absorbed the dark-skinned savage aborigines. And this is the civilizational theory which you can see in the work of G.S. Gurier, the first so-called father of Indian sociology. This theory was critical in producing the basic divisions of groups into, in India into Aryan and non-Aryan races. And Aryan races were very important because there was a belief presented by European modernists that, the, that they believed the first that the Greeks were very important to their own modernity and then the next civilization, which was Indian, was important precisely because they got influenced by the Greeks. So the Aryans were the white skin which came from Greece to uh, colonize this region. They brought the civilization and therefore Indian civilization became so significant. That is the story. <clears throat> this theory was critical in producing the basic divisions of groups into, in India into Aryan and non-Aryan races. Now terms caste, that is white skins were caste, and uh, original, aboriginal were the tribes. 
What is of interest is the fact that while castes were defined in the context of Hinduism as groups who cultivated land, had better technology and high civilizational attribute, the tribes were defined in contrast to castes who practiced so-called primitive technology lived in interior jungles and were animistic in religious practices. They also found manifestation um, in the African continent as British officials used this knowledge to construct categories of social groups in Africa and transfer these newly constructed classifications back again into India, as happened in the case of the term tribe as a lineage group based on a segmentary state. So there was a... a Circulation of the concept of tribe, first imposed in Africa, then brought back in India, and now it is used to categorize groups in the heartland of India and the northeast part of India. And it's become part of the, of the categories that structure uh, um, um, affirmative action today. In the process, caste and tribe as categories were made out to be far more pervasive and totalizing and uniform concept than ever before and defined in terms of a religious order, which was never so earlier. In fact, ancient and medieval historiographers now inform us that those whom we identify as castes and tribes were groups that were shaped by political struggles and processes over material resources. In pre-colonial India, multiple parkers of identity defined relationship between groups and were contingent on many complex processes which were constantly changing and were related to political power. Thus, pre-colonial India had temple communities, territorial groups, lineage segments, family units, royal retinues, warrior subcasts, little kingdoms, large kingdoms, occupational reference subcasts, um, uh, groups, agriculture and trading associations, networks of devotional uh, sectarian religious communities, and priestly cables. All never organized in terms of these categories that colonial knowledge did. So those who came under the name caste as defined by the colonial powers were just one category among the many and one way of representing an organizing identity. So from the range that was there, one was isolated and institutional. These categories, that of caste and tribe, were further refined once the colonial authorities organized the revenue settlements to facilitate a taxation system. British officials searched for a new classification to understand and assess the material conditions that organized groups within the Indian subcontinent. On one hand, the rulers needed to create special units for the maintenance of law and order, as well as for the regular collection of taxes once they were assessed. Simultaneously, on the other, they needed to ensure proper collection and thus created new positions, which they did based on their knowledge of the way taxation worked in England. Three units were created in India, villages, estates, and properties, and had parallel roads in Africa. The village was now given a boundedness, making it almost an island society in which communities of caste lived in harmony. This perception came to be firmly embedded as it resonated in many ways in and since colonialism, both in nationalist thought and in the sociological imagination. Thus, when empirical social science developed in the 50s and 60s, sociologists made village the locale for understanding the caste system. So we had first the space uh, culture being reduced to territory of India, then it got reduced as a result of the revenue settlements to the village. So the microsome became the macrosome. No wonder Dux has argued that the colonial conquest was sustained not only by superior arms and military organization, but also through cultural technology of rule. Colonial conquest and knowledge both enable ways to rule and to construct what colonialism was all about, its own self-knowledge. The British played a major role in identifying and producing an Indian quote-unquote tradition, that is, a be the belief and customs of those living in the region. B.S. Cohn has said, the Chicago anthropologist has said, in the so conceptual scheme which the British created to understand and to act in India, they constantly followed the same logic. They reduced vastly complex codes and associated meanings to a new few metonyms. 
This process allowed them to save themselves the effort of understanding or adequately explaining subtle or not so subtle meanings attached to the actions of their subjects. Once the British had defined something as an Indian custom or a traditional dress or a proper form of salutation, any deviations from it was defined as a rebellion or an act to be punished. India was redefined by the British to be a place of rules and order. Once the British had defined to their own satisfaction what they constructed as Indian rules and customs, then the Indians had to conform to these constructions. This is this form of categorization and uh, classification called colonized rule. If it is created norms for rule, also benefited, and this is important, one indigenous group, the Brahmins, who were now given enhanced status that of an indigenous intellectual. Other political entities that had authority, such as that in the region, village or neighborhood communities, kinship groups, factional parties, chief authority, chiefly authorities, political affiliations, all got superseded, deleted from knowledge frameworks, and silenced. And as anthropology moved beyond classification, ethnographic studies assess racial stocks through physical, physical ethnomorphic studies was slowly replaced by the ideological approach. That is the study of India through scriptures. The position and the study of India through scriptures and mainly uh, associated with the work of Max Müller, the German uh, Indologist, who, who translated many of India, um, the traditional Hindu scriptures. Um, he uh, implied that if you want to study anything of India, if you have to look at religious texts. And that by implication it meant society was all about religion. And what religions, religion stated was society, was what um, was that society. And this position now dominated Indian anthropology and also was picked up by Indian, Indian indigenous intellectuals who started framing new knowledge on the, on the, on the, on the, on the existing terms set up by British anthropologists and this approach which is called the civilizational approach um, is associated with the work of G.S. Guri. The attributes now justify the study of India as a pre-literate, pre-modern society, henceforth in India as in other ex-colonized countries, sociology carved out an arena of knowledge for itself by asserting its differences from the modern Western societies and using anthropological lenses to assess these differences. The binary regarding the study of Western society or as modern society being the main focus of sociology as against non-Western societies as or predicted pre-modern societies being the domain of social anthropology now becomes further legitimated. It now becomes clear that many of the categories do not approximate either empirically or theoretically the varied nature of social experience that inhabited the region <coughs> or represent the identities carried by groups that lived in India. This categorization instead homogenizes these experiences in new ways and standardizes behavioral patterns through the construction of law, thus creating potentialities for conflicts and fractions in, the, in society. Additionally, this legitimizes the authority of one group, the Brahmins, as knowledge constructors, thus creating conditions for domination of and by this group in Indian society. No wonder issues of identity and violence remain integral to the subsequent history of the subcontinent. It is in this context that one has to assess um, the alternate positions that have emerged in India and in, in the ex-colonial regions. And that is what I would like to go next to. What are the alternate um, ways to understand the country that came up as a result of nationalism? Um, it is this, it is by going into, into, into um, this way of thinking was institutionalized uh, from the 1920s um, onwards, as I said, with the University of Bombay setting up its sociology department where G.S. Gurie put forward this institutionalized way, anthropological way of understanding sociology. And it is only in the 
1940s and 50s with the growth of the nationalist movement that you find a certain change taking place. And there, in that context, I want to go back to methodological nationalism. As I said, that the colonial knowledge uh, reduced the territory to culture, to, to space, so space to culture to religion. Okay? And, and defined in that space the peculiar, the particular that structures that space. And there were two groups, set two kinds of groups. One is the caste and one is the tribes that were organized. There was, as a second level, another division, that of majority and minority. Majority being Hinduism and minority being other religions. So it was religion, caste, and Hinduism, caste, and tribes that organized the sociology of the society. Society called India at that point of time. <clears throat> it is in this context that one has to look at how sociology developed in the post 50s. The post 50 is a period in which development and modernization became the agenda of the state. And in which it was thought that social science has to reflect the agenda of development and the state. And in order to reflect that agenda of development and modernization, it has to create a language for it. And it has to create not only a language for it, but organize that language to help form planning and development. What is significant at this moment is to emphasize that the group, the elite that took over the, the, the organization of state in the 1950s was uh, elite which had its um, lineage in one aspect of nationalism, one group of nationalists which were called modernists. There were other groups of nationalists called traditionalists um, who were more involved with the kind of studies that I had just discussed, that is the civilizational analysis. It was the modernists who believed that industrialization and um, urbanization which will help the India to become modern and that there is no need to look at the past but it is to look at the future and it is this modernist which took over the control of the state and therefore defined social science in terms of a modern agenda uh, of what the state had to construct for itself in terms of a social science language and therefore the three aspects that we discuss about methodological nationalism that it was an epistemic structure and program of social science shaped by and attached to the experience of modern state, that it took nationalist discourses, agendas, loyalties, and histories for granted, and that it territorialized social science in terms of a, of a, of a social imaginary. All this, which are considered negative aspects of social science of the 50s and the 60s, were actually considered the positive aspects for the construction of national social science. And therefore, self-consciously, Indian social scientists got involved in the project of creating a national social science. Earlier, the question of territory and, and the location and, and its reduction to culture had happened as a result of colonization of uh, the colonial rule. Now, it took the same, um, same, um, same way of thinking to reorganize social science in terms of um, this uh, project of nation building and to create information, data, knowledge for this purpose. So economics, political science, and sociology, and a little bit of psychology were harnessed to organize uh, this knowledge and to create the da uh, create um, therefore databases to create uh, and organize knowledge so that it <clears throat> it comes to the aid of uh, of uh, the nation state <coughs> what uh, beck calls as a unassumed uh, un uh, as a as an assumption which is uh, built in into social uh, social sciences and sociology in particular was actually a principle which helped it to confront colonial knowledges, 
and reframe these colonial knowledges in terms of new ways of presenting um, social phenomena. There was therefore an attempt, especially in economics and political science, to understand political participation, to understand quote unquote markets, to understand um, um, changes in, um, uh, uh, you know, to understand uh, uh, how to relate um, um, employment and, and to upgrade, uh, in uh, upgrade uh, ways in which uh, the country can be organized in terms of um, more accumula uh, accumulation and therefore more distribution of resources. But what is interesting in, in this um, structure that got established is that, um, and therefore to, to, to realize this goal, um, re aid res um, the, uh, the, un uh, the state uh, set up social science research bodies, they set up uh, universities, uh, today we have 400 universities with most universities having more than 100,000 students. So there's a huge um, investment that went into education, but also social science research and also giving um, aid for social science research to, for this objective. But what is interesting is the language that sociology um, put itself uh, or organized itself in. Because um, the, a large part of sociology was organized in terms of castes and tribes, what happened was an emphasis that sociology now has to divide itself from anthropology and to ensure that it studies modern India, because that was the objective to study modern India. But what was interesting is that they pushed the study of tribes to anthropology but it pushed the study of caste as study of modern India. Uh, not the study of other groups, but study of caste. And, and that, is res, uh, that is so evidently uh, structured in terms of Evan Srinivas's work on caste in modern India, etc. Because they took it for granted that, um, that what, was, what is seen is the modernity of caste. And therefore, these are the original groups, indigenous groups that that got um, that that had to confront, had to uh, uh, had to uh, contest uh, colonial rule, and therefore were reorganizing themselves. But that the key category here was caste, and that and in interesting way, the civilizational perspective was brought back by suggesting that India's civilizational has always assimilated other um, cultures um, and uh, um, that these cultures and the last one being the Western and therefore this civilization will also assimilate this new culture and social change in modern India would be of an assimilative kind and would not be a break from pre-modern. If sociologists in 19th century suggested that there was a break between pre-modern and modern in Europe in the Atlantic region, this was not so of the theories that were structured in the 50s and the 60s. And therefore there was more continuities with the colonial knowledge than a break with the colonial knowledge. And it is, it is, um, it, so <laughs> nationalist project got organized in case of sociology with continuities of the colonial knowledge rather than the discontinuities of colonial knowledge, which is not true for political science and economics. And I think that distinction is very important to, to keep in mind because that um, struct has structured and organized um, um, sociological language in, in, um, in 50s, 60s, and 70s. It is thus, uh, which, which meant what? It meant village was the unit of, um, uh, was the unit of investigation. So you had enormous number of village uh, thesis is done. This village, cast in this village, cast in that village, cast in that village. Um, um, 
there was a relationship between caste and religion. So all kinds of relationships between caste and religion were framed out. There was hardly any thesis on contestations between castes, which should have uh, been there, but hardly any thesis on that, or hardly any work on reflection on any, any conflict, any contestation even between castes. And of course, uh, uh, this caste was um, um, were, uh, seen as those who, you know, a certain kind of modernization thesis got institutionalized in, in this uh, understanding of social change. So castes were seen as being mobile. And therefore, you know, a reference group theory was, uh, was uh, used to justify and legitimize caste, uh, you know, mobility. And therefore, uh, westernization would be one way in which hierarchies would be broken down. It is the late 70s, you know, which, which has reorganized this problematic that, it, that was inherited during the colonial period. So what my thesis is, and I must say something, that this thesis is not something that, uh, um, that is accepted across India because there's been debate I'm having with various colleagues of mine. My thesis is that colonial knowledge continued from the late 19th century when it framed itself in censuses and ethnographies through categorization and classification systems to Indology to racial analysis and got structured um, in, um, in the, within indigenous intellectuals as well as uh, in the work of the indigenous intellectuals as well as later in academic knowledge. And that continuity continues till 1970s. It is only after 1970s as social movements against upper caste, as environmental movements and as women's movement emerges in the late 70s and 80s that there is a move to reframe sociology. But this move to reframe sociology occurs only because the state has also become weak. And it is at the point when the state withdraws itself from its agendas of creating a social science for the nation state and for the new modern state, and it moves itself slowly towards first export-led and then neoliberal agendas. It is at that point of time that uh, 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 a rethinking is taking place about what constitutes social science in India, quote unquote. And in this rethinking of what constitutes social science, there are two pressures. One pressure comes from, of course, the trends towards globalization. The diaspora, South Asia, you know, you have enormous literature coming out now. Um, and then, you know, most South Asians refer to Arjuna Bhutarai, who talks about, um, you know, the, the continuities, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the the ethnies which move across boundaries of nation state. Um, there is, of course, another, uh, so globalization leads to migration and therefore it leads to the questioning of uh, whether the state is any longer the, the definer of society and groups. But if that is so, the second tension comes from um, movements that question the state from below. And these movements have questioned at the level of self-determination, ask for separate states, and have asked for, as a separate nation states, have conceived itself as nations, and as nation state, and has demanded independence. It's not only Kashmir, but there are many such movements going on in the country. And, and this, this, uh, this pressure from above, and the pressure from below, in as well as the movements against caste hierarchy, the growth of the feminist movement and the questioning of patriarchy, and the growth of the environmental movement, all has led to a reformulation, not only of economics and political science, but mainly of sociology, because it was too caught up in the colonial categories. 
while political and econ uh, economics, political science and economics had, had moved forward much more. And uh, this, this upsurge has led to, I think, and I would end up here, I think five kinds of questions regarding uh, sociological knowledge. Um, and uh, uh, these are the following. Uh, the first relates to the development of critical language to study the history of the discipline. And this is a big exercise now. In the last five, in the last five years, at least three to four books have come out on the history of the subject. And how do we understand the history of the subject? And there's a debate going on between sociologists on the history of the subject. Um, uh, maybe I should advertise my book, which has just come out sure. a few months back. It's called Doing Sociology <coughs> in India, Oxford. Uh, <coughs> The first relates to the development of critical language to the study of the history of the discipline. How and through what theories and methods can sociologists in India reflect on the way dominant colonial and post-independent discourses have framed the discipline's organization? What tools should they use and why? And more specifically, how can writing its history help to reconstruct its future? Two, what position should it involve regarding the theories constructed during colonial and nationalist phases? Are these to be termed colonial and are these to be termed nationalist? And how does that help us to understand sociology? Uh, did they really promote one, on one hand, anthropology, on the other hand, sociology? What is their relationship with colonialism? Is, it, is, it, is there a relationship or not? Did they reify social processes and misrepresent it? the documentation and assessments of the intersubjective meshings of the laterals of the class, caste, and gender quote-unquote communities of the pre-modern subcontinent, and thereby altered ways of understanding and thinking about them, and institutionalize them as the only frame of reference. How does we, how do we deconstruct it? Third, in what ways should sociologists dialogue with other branches of knowledge? from natural sciences to social sciences to reorient the discipline's epistemic agenda and reframe it to assess themes of survival, poverty, and exclusions facing the majority in India. So if the first two questions were of history and theory, the next question is of contemporary problems. As a consequence of class and caste gender nature of the country's modernist project, and it's really a critique of country's modernist project, most women and men belonging to lower caste, ethnicity, tribal and minority religious groups work and labor in what is called the informal economy, where 96% of India's poor, I mean working class, are in, in the informal economy. So only 4% are in the manufacturing organized sector. So given the 96% of this, of this uh, um, group, being in this, um, this kind of a work situation, um, how does their participation determine the nature of exclusions and insecurities of their individual and collective life worlds? What kind of interdisciplinary language does one formulate to reflect the sociabilities emerging in and through this modernist experience? And what does this modernism mean? Fourth, what is the object and scope of the sociological investigation? Should sociologists study the varied nations and the excluded within the territory defined by the Indian nation state? Or also assess the sociabilities of the many of the subcontinent's communities spread across the world or both? By this I mean that there's enormous study. I mean, if you look at the work done by Asian Studies Association in, um, in Europe and in, uh, in the United States, there's a huge study of the South Asian diaspora. However, Migration from India has been taking place from 18, 19, 20th centuries. <coughs> the migration has been to Suriname, to South Africa, to the Eastern African coast, to Malaysia, to Sri Lanka, to Southeast Asia. How do we study that? And uh, should therefore not these be also part of the study? And thereby, what does it mean 
to talk about India. Can it, re um, uh, can it and should it retain a very particularistic understanding of what constitutes India in terms of a cultural frame which colonization structured itself into? How can it create a language that can assess the force and voluntary mobilities of the many out migrants of the region now placed in varied class positions across the world and relate this with that of so-called India? Um, fifth, and lastly, what relationship should it involve, evolve in, in terms of the new internationalism in sociology? And that is the key issue which is now organizing the debate in India. Do these give new pathways for those practicing, practicing sociology in India, or do these merely repeat new ways colonial uh, the, in new ways colonial practices of rule? And, uh, and this question is very relevant because there is an entire, um, uh, as part of uh, new um, structures of globalization of knowledge, um, uh, there is uh, uh, enormous effort uh, to have uh, uh, courses, programs, uh, research programs, teaching programs uh, with universities across the world, including India. And they, they come with their programs, they come with their courses, they come with uh, their research uh, agendas. And comparative uh, quantitative work um, uh, and research has, incre has increased enormously. And what is interesting, it's repeating the same kind of um, uh, organization of research. Natives are taken to do research, to do research while um, um, conceptual work is done outside. So this becomes a very important issue of debate. And this is again part of the larger global order and the, uh, and the way in which research is organized in terms of large macro comparative work that is being done. Mainly done by political scientists but a lot of sociologists are involved in, in this value. You must be familiar with value research, etc., etc., which is going on across the world. So should sociologists in India use an extensive version of theories and methodologies being practiced in the North and participate in the practices being organized by the problematic of cosmopolitan and global sociology, which is another way in which internationalization is taking place, or does it need to have go back and have nationalist moorings, like in the 50s? Um, or go back to have an indigenous mooring, like in the... 1920s? Um, or is there a third way to relate with these questions? And would the third way relate again back to the movements that organize and have been organized new utopias against the nation state? But if that is so, then how does one see uh, research outside the so-called India, where these utopias don't want to, I mean, they don't move? So I, I have argued that um, at all levels, um, in terms of state, territory, um, culture, nation, there is there's an opening up now. Um, without <coughs> without um, being able to resolve these questions, there is a debate whether um, the continuities that have come from colonialism um, can restructure sociology in India. But by itself, stating that, it's got into a problem because it talks about India. And um, India is not the territory through which it can look at uh, itself. And, uh, and I think this kind of a problem raises also uh, questions for all national sociologists. Thank you. Sure, Paula. Um, well, I guess I have sort of two questions, uh, a two-part, if that's okay. My first one is, do you think that the importance of having um, sort of an Indian, more specific sociology is important because 
it's developed there, so it helps explain um, the features of Indian society better. And the second part would be then, since it is such a large and diverse country, would even um, an Indian sociology for the whole country be too, almost too universal? I, I myself prefer back and forth rather than an accumulation of questions, you know. And yeah, I mean, the two are related to each other. Mm -hmm. um, uh, local movements have questioned the universalization um, of, um, of uh, uh, sociology in terms of uh, upper class, upper caste modernist agenda, which which organized the national and the nation uh, national social science, which um, which at one level invisibilized them, at another level made them visible in wrong ways. So uh, they have questioned that agenda, and they want to throw it out with the bathwater. That is. Uh, uh, so if you take that position, then there is no need for a national social. And I'm sure this is true of other um, other national sociologists. Um, but at the same time, um, if you look at it in terms of history of ideas, the history of ideas is related, if not to a nationalist, but at least to the collapse of nation, state, and territory and culture, which came with colonization. You can, even if you want to throw it out, you need to engage with what you want to throw out. And therefore, um, uh, that engagement is necessary in terms of understanding the history, if at all. But that would mean fragmentation of knowledge itself. But these social movements are trying to attempt to do, build their own, shall I say, social imagination, and, and thereby using what are considered research practices in academia to organize and understand what is happening. And thereby, I would think it's as as sociological as any work done in universities, you know. So I I would I would suggest that that is also important. But my position is something else. Uh, I'll explain it much more uh, tomorrow. But I think my position my position is that you can't have one or the other. You have to have both, because. Um, 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 without which the, both represent the contestations and the contestations need to be captured um, and you can't have one or the other and uh, therefore there has to be parallel and plural um, agendas rather than one single nationalist agenda of what constitutes social science now. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for that extreme, for sketching an extremely compelling trajectory of, of the history. Well, of why don't we all, since we're a small group, we can int introduce yourselves. Of course. Uh, my name is Martin Lee, Martin Lee Krishnamurthy. I'm a Mellon postdoc here in anthropology and humanities. Okay. And uh, I was sort of curious towards the end of your talk, especially very convincing argument, and I think your position makes for a lot of sense in contemporary India right now, about the role of interdisciplinarity or even its possibility. So you talk about economics and political science sort of breaking away from aligning with either a colonialist or a nationalist agenda at a certain point, but then they also as, you know, align themselves with the globalization agenda. Yeah. Right? And so my second question is also then, would you talk a little bit more about the role of critique? Because in some ways, which relates to my third question, which is this idea of how education is being structured, especially with the private education bill. I've been in talks with a number of small private colleges in India, all promoting a liberal arts education, right? and they want to bring together this kind of interdisciplinarity, but without considering the role of critique. And I was wondering if you could talk to them, because it's worrisome in some ways. Yeah. Um, I, I did mention that um, with the nationalist agenda um, um, slowly giving up um, um, and um, export oriented and neoliberal uh, policies emerging um, um, it's the time when the critique also emerges uh, 
And the critic has to do, as I said, with the social movements. I think the most important critic came from feminists, late 70s. Um, 75, 77 is, I think, uh, the Mathurade case. So you start uh, from that, anti-dowry, anti-rape, and then it moves on further to all questions of development. What is very interesting is that um, the critique it's also um, the feminist critique and then the environmentalist critique as well as then the later critiques have placed this whole question of nation and development in a very in a very different way where they haven't abandoned development and nation state intervention at the same time has criticized one agenda of it so that tension I think affects the way in which organization of knowledge is taking place. And, uh, and that tension is, I think, pe peculiar to the way in which Indian academy as well as Indian activism has got structure. Um, um, I've noticed across the world, you know, where there is complete abandonment of the notion of nation and nationalism. This doesn't take place in the critique in India. It's not anti-nationalist. It is not against um, nationalism. Uh, Europe is caught into that imagination of against nationalism. Um, a large part of um, maybe Latin America and some African countries also are caught into this uh, thing of against nationalism. This is not true. Of, and this, this tension is organizing, I think, uh, ways in which uh, there is an entry point in academia of uh, this problem. <laughs> and um, uh, at a point when simultaneous the state is becoming neoliberal um, and encouraging private colleges, so you have uh, the dismantling of academia taking place in public sector, dismantling of practices that will help to make the academia grow. And um, the university is um, pauperized today, uh, don't have library resources, 400 universities don't have library resources, don't have many of the things that are needed, and at the same time you have these elite colleges emerging, and there are two levels of them. The first is the franchised elite colleges, private colleges, which come from United States and England. Um, Cambridge, ha Cambridge uh, I mean, but Melbourne and Australian uh, <laughs> All of them are there, they're franchises. They get the degree from University of Melbourne and University of Cambridge, but they are uh, in India. And they are, uh, they give the courses as, you know, this is for the second tire of the elite who cannot come to, uh, to United States or to England um, and cannot spend that kind of money, but will spend a second level of money for, for, for that, for these courses. But there is a, another tire of private colleges, which come out from the investment done by uh, the new bourgeoisie of, of the new mobile bourgeoisie of uh, India, who think education is a way to, first on tax benefits, and secondly to try and control again for the, the region around them, you know. Education is actually a way to get money into politics. It's, there's a very deep <coughs> connection between corruption, education, and politics in India. Because um, you have to pay high, high amounts to be educated, this money then goes to the politicians. <coughs> there's a deep connection on this in India. And um, it has led to so many contesting <laughs> Um, structures and there's such unevenness. So it depends on which region we are talking about and at which point of time these colleges have started and private education has taken place. Um, um, there is uh, there has been uh, um, new ways of handling. Uh, there has been uh, chaotic, I would say, um, arbitrary. Un, uh, unnecessary programs coming up, you know, without understanding what you are doing and why you are doing. And that chaos right now is huge. 
um, you know, and it's affected, um, it's created hierarchies of departments, it has created hierarchies of educational values, it has created many, many levels of uh, differences between metropolitan and non-metropolitan universities and colleges, etc., etc. So you can't map it very clearly today. Um, the, it's very chaotic. But that chaos comes from different patterns which are uh, emerging as a result of the breakdown of the national state. But at the same time, it also has the vibrancy of the uh, social movement agenda which thinks nation state is important. So it is, it is, it is both, you know, it's happening at a, uh, and, and I think uh, at the most elite level, um, uh, globalization is playing a very major role, both in terms of transfer of ideas, transfer of pedagogic practices, and um, transfer of uh, the circulation of academic elite from India to US to back. And they are very important in the circulation that is taking place. Can you just ask a follow-up question? So in some ways it is I'm sorry for this. Okay. Just so in, in Joe's place, and where is Indian sociology or Indian anthropology being produced, right? The universities that were traditionally the bastion, they're being popularized, they're losing people, they have no money for resources, mm -hmm. and you have all of these small nodal points of globalization power coming up which are also supposed to produce knowledge of a certain kind, be it according to the agenda of rural elites, or provincial elites, or this kind of academic transnationalism. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about you know, methodological nationalism, there's also a different kind of nationalism being produced. And where is Indian knowledge being produced? Is it even possible to talk about it in this, in this particular time and space? Um, I ended up by asking where, where is the na nation and nationalism in, uh, in all this because there is an enormous importance and significance given to national so sociologies or anthropologies or political science in social sciences. And you know that's because associations make them valorize national sociologies. Um, and uh, they have, and what is paradoxical to see is that Indian sociological society is increasing its membership it's, um, it has more money, it has more resources, it, is, it, it calls now the President of International Sociological Association every year for its conferences. It, it just become, it, it, it becomes, it has become so significant and important at a point of time when, you, as you say, the actual practices are, are and, and the actual work is, de is decreasing and the quality of work is decreasing. Um, and um, and um, there are only peaks, some peaks remaining, um, and then there is work done outside academia, which is which is phenomenal. But um, there is no meeting point, and there is no it's chaos, you know, all over. And this is not true only of sociology and anthropology; it is true of economics and political science. Of course, economics is produced by the state through the planning commission, through, through the work done by that. But much of the work on poverty, on uh, social exclusion is done outside the state. Yeah. So I think uh, we have many contestations and contradictions emerging. And I don't know <laughs> what is the future in this. Yeah. I don't know. But I certainly don't think national sociologies reflect all this. Um, I had something I'd like to raise. This is, this, is, this is really interesting and helped to clarify some of the things. So part of what was in play in our discussion, I think it's more a question of the rhetoric we used to describe similar phenomena, because uh, I felt your exposition today about the nature of the transformations of the classification systems and where they come from and how they work and their material consequences. Uh, to me, that was all straightforward sociology of knowledge. And I had no trouble relating to it as a way of sociologically explaining the character of the practices of different periods in the development of Indian sociology. And it, it brought to mind um, an important episode in the US 
around racial classification, uh, which could be told in a rather, in some, in certain ways, in a rather similar way. That is, what's in play in the classification system is interests and power. So some classification systems are threatening, and other classifications are not. And in particular, in the eight, in the late 19th century, after slavery, there was a question of how race was to be classified in the U.S. Was it to be a binary classification, or was it to be a gradational classification? Right, with many possible forms, you know, uh, mulattoes, quadroons, octoons, I mean, all these kinds of complicated. Now, one place in the United States had a long historical tradition of a very complicated racial classification system, Louisiana. It was different from the rest of the South. Uh, probably, it's thought because of its Catholic and French historical influence. That's the usual way that's described, that Louisiana didn't have a binary racial system. Mm -hmm. Now, it had a binary free slave system under slavery, but there were lots of black slave owners mm -hmm. in Louisiana because the free slave was the key issue. And then the pure racial classification had this had way more complexity than in the rest of the South. Uh, what happened in the segregation era was that Louisiana was homogenized with the rest of the South. They were all governed by the one, so-called one-drop rule, which produced a binary racial classification system. And then that had material consequences for the lives of people. So it wasn't just a cognitive category. It was inscribed in law at the top to determine who was excluded, who was included, who, had, who could go to what schools. So that by the end of that period, Louisiana really wasn't that different from the rest of the South through the material practices of that classification system. And so now that has some similarities to the argument that the British come in, there's this hugely complex structure of cross-cutting cleavages and divisions and differences which are organized on all sorts of different principles. And they need to figure out some way to dominate they have to mobilize ideas to secure their conditions of domination. And they fix on this very limited set, and then they simplify those. Right? So it's not just they pick the tribe and cast out all the possible ways of classifying, but they even butcher those yeah. right? and turn them into. Right? So, uh, and then that helps to secure their rule, because it can mobilize segments. And then it ramifies into the categories that the actors in India, not just the colonial administrators, use to, to think. Right? So that seems like a very similar, in a way, it's a similar kind of transaction. Now, to me, that's a story of power, interests, and domination. And this happens in Africa. Also. Right, of course, in Af Africa is a classic case. The creation of tribes out of a much more complicated set of, yeah. you know, not uh, not clearly binary yeah. divisions. Yeah. Right? And Southeast Asia. Also. Yeah. So I. So I think we're on exactly the same footing with respect to the actual explanations for how categories get used, how they intersect systems of rule, how they become materially embodied in institutions. Um, and so the, the only place where I don't see that we're talking about the same thing is I don't think this is an epistemological question at all. I don't see any I think it's entirely a question of how power and interest shape the way ideas get deployed to restrict or open up possibilities of understanding things. Mm -hmm. So it does have cognitive effects. It does affect the way people think. But the mechanisms aren't epistemological. The mechanisms are power, interest, classification. And that's what sociology of knowledge would <coughs> say. Um, but I don't also think there's, it matters whether we're, who's right on this, because the substance of your argument is exactly, you know, I mean, I don't know enough about India to know whether you're, how accurate it is, but it seems totally credible. Yeah. But and this is not what done by Indians, it's done by anthropologists, mm -hmm. you know. They have, uh, uh, and they based in the United States, most of them, who have laid out how this happened, you know. They, they are the ones who have interrogated this whole question since the 70s now. Um, and based in Columbia and Chicago, etc., etc. Yeah. I'm just picking up the argument. Right. <laughs> well, uh, and, that's, and that's the same process by which social scientists here have been debunking 
the classification systems that American sociology has imposed on American society as a as a way of obscuring and silencing like certain first nations. Or? Well, in class, I mean, from my in my corner of the disciplinary world, class the way class has been butchered and transformed into a set of categories that demobilizes rather than mobilizes people. Mm. Mm. Other, other issues anyone wants to raise for today? Yes? I'm just curious, I'm Peter Swift from Geography. Uh, if you could talk a little bit more about the social movement side of sociology and what that looks like, what people are looking into, and how it, how it works. Mm -hmm. Outside well, of formal reasons, I guess. Is you know, when I said late 70s was the period in which social movements emerged, the first was the feminist movement. And the feminist movement has been in India divided into two kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, mobilizations. One is, of course, the middle class, uh, so-called quote-unquote middle class, urban base mobilization, which looked at individual uh, problems of individual rights, domestic violence, rape, etc. But it is um, um, the movements that came with um, the feminist movement, which emerged with in interaction with cla other class-based movements of peasants, agrarian laborers, um, um, mine workers, etc., where the tension between class and gender was organized. And um, uh, they were also involved, interestingly enough, on environmental questions. And all this necessitated that they look at, you know, what is the region, what is the locality, how to assess and understand it. They started putting together information data which was not the state-sponsored one, but what they had experienced uh, as a result of their of the moment. And um, um, so, I won't name names, but there are so many social movements, localized social movements, uh, which were emerging in the late 70s, early 80s, all across the country, which created, um, which had their own so-called organic intellectuals, who wrote about them, who wrote about these, uh, uh, these movements, and I think we have enormous material that they have brought together. Um, and these are not in formal books, you see. The, uh, there's another thing I need to talk about here. There is a formal production of knowledge, and there is an informal production of knowledge. There are something called little magazines, pamphlets, etc., where the the knowledge that that puts to the knowledge that is put together there is very different from the formal production of knowledge. The formal production of knowledge is controlled again by uh, subsidiaries of international, global um, publishing houses. So Oxford, <laughs> Rutledge, uh, Sage, uh, name it. They all have their subsidiaries in, in, in India. So that is the formal production of knowledge. They generally produce only academics, you know, or established academics. At one time, they, Oxford didn't even publish anyone outside Delhi. You know, it, it was so, so controlled, you know. So, um, uh, uh, but there is this informal level of production in, in, in one's own languages. So the language is also different, it's not English. Language is also an issue of tension in, in, in India, you know, English versus non-English. And, um, um, I think each movement produced its own, uh, um, its own um, what it what it was fighting for in the, in trying to lay out what it was fighting for. It did surveys, it did ethnographic work, it did uh, uh, looked at uh, looked at earlier historical work. It put together so much of literature which was not even thought of because um, the nation reified this kind of, valorize this kind of local, uh, they, they didn't think these local issues were important. So thereby each of these movements <laughs> defined their, the boundaries of its own look, its own organization of knowledge. So there's another paradox happening here. 
again another space is getting caught into culture as a result of local movements emerging. And I think this tension is there across the world, you know, it's not particular to India. At every point that problem of space and culture and uh, it's, it's, it's caught up. And, um, um, and given the varieties that are there in, in the country, it becomes very difficult to, um, to, to, I think the challenge is that we don't have uh, theories to organize, to see it as, um, um, to ensure that we don't get caught into administrative categories at the same time um, know that cultural frames of reference are not caught in territorial boundaries. How do we negotiate that? I think is a problem. That's good. Um, this one actually thought that was sort of triggered by this also. Um, in this, in the, the, the kind of off the shelf standard way now of talking about these classification issues, you know, where do the categories come from, is to invoke the notion of classification struggle rather than just the imposition of classifications. Mm -hmm. Now, the colonial context may be distinctive from the unilateral mm -hmm. quality of the imposition of categories, mm -hmm. uh, unlike the efforts of creating classifications internal to a structure where there's typically resistance to a classification that's in the service of particular interests. Uh, so, that, so that may give some specificity to the particular form of colonial imposition of yeah. cognitive categories. It's unilateral quality. It's not a negotiated set of yeah. new classifications. It's just an imposition. Mm -hmm. But that could also vary mm -hmm. over time. You know, depending upon the colonial context, depending upon the literacy of the yeah. subject population, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in, in the Indian discussion, is there yes, around the because today the classification system is contested. Now, but when, when the British created no. these, it was just a unilateral imposition. Yeah, without. because it was colonial rule. There was never any question of taking the natives into cognizance, in except the Brahmins. Who liked this classification system because it yeah because so it, it it was the world of uh, a social order that they wanted right I understand 